Continuing on with Chapter 37, we're looking at the Eisenhower era from 1952 to 1960. Now, like I said before, the 1950s is uh, an era where a lot of stuff is going on all at the same time. The Cold War is raging, uh, massive changes within American society are occurring, uh, the start of the Civil Rights Movement, etc. Uh, and part of this Cold War also comes in the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War is an example where uh, the Cold War, quote, heated up, it got hot, because our goal here is to contain communism, much like we saw with Korea. Now, to back up a little bit, prior to World War II, uh, the Southeast Asian colony of Indochina was controlled by the French. Indochina is now today Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. They had been controlled by the French since about the late 1800s. But during World War II, uh, that then transferred to the Japanese because the Japanese were taking over um, the Pacific. Um, under the... Um, uh, during the French's term, uh, Ho Chi Minh had started to already rise to power. He was a communist, and he was asking for, he was demanding uh, an independent Vietnam. Uh, his party that was demanding this uh, end of colonization from the French and a change to um, uh, communism was known as the Viet Minh. The Viet Minh is only during the colonization era of France. That's going to change later. Um, and after World War II was over, French regained control of their colony. And the efforts were renewed even more by these communist Viet Minh to push the French out. Uh, they were not interested in being a colony anymore. Um, now, the United States, as much as we hated colonization and as much as we were promoting democratization at the end of World War II, we're also caught between a rock and a hard place because we also don't like communism either. Um, and so we had been supplying money and aid to the French during this uh, assault by the Viet Minh. But in May of 1954, at, after, I don't know, 50-plus day uh, siege at the, uh, port, or at the uh, fort of Dien Bien Phu, the French left uh, Indochina. They they had been completely destroyed by the Viet Minh uh, guerrilla army, and they left the country, splitting the country in half at the 17th parallel. That was decided at the Geneva Conference. Um, to the north of the 17th parallel, Ho Chi Minh and the communists would be in charge with the capital of Hanoi. Uh, to the south of the 17th uh, parallel would be South Vietnam, led by anti-communists. We're not going to call them a democracy, because they absolutely were not. Uh, and they would have the capital city of Saigon. They would be led by the American hand-picked um, person known as No Dinh Diem. He would be the South Vietnamese leader. Um, now, at the Geneva Conference, aside from temporarily dividing the country at the 17th parallel, they also decided that within two years they would have a, an election throughout the entire uh, country of Vietnam, and that would determine how they would reunify Vietnam, under whose leadership it would happen. But as we get closer and closer to 1956, uh, Nodin Diem starts to realize, and the Americans start to realize, that he doesn't have a chance to win this election at all because the, he is so completely unpopular. Uh, aside from being extremely rigid and aside from being very... Um, uh, uh, anti-land reform with his policies. He's also a Catholic. He persecuted the uh, Buddhist uh, population within Vietnam. And so he is extremely unpopular. Contrast that to the very popular Ho Chi Minh in the north. And the Americans, led by with No Din Diem, decide to cancel these free elections because they know their guy is not going to win. Oh, one other thing. Uh, Eisenhower had worried that if Vietnam, quote, fell to communism, that this would create a domino effect, that this would spread throughout the rest of Southeast Asia. And remember, our goal is to contain communism. So here you see the dividing line between North and South, uh, North being communist, South being non-communist. Uh, here you see the two different leaders, uh, Ho Chi Minh on the left and No Dinh Diem on the right. So that's the start of the Vietnam War. We'll get to that later on as well, because obviously that's going to play a major role in our history. Um, over in the Middle East, uh, our attempt to control the rest of the world continues. In Iran in 1953, the Iranian Prime Minister Mohammad Mosaddegh um, attempted to take away uh, Western countries from 
the uh, United States, basically to nationalize the um, uh, American-held companies, aka oil companies, that we uh, had there. The CIA instead uh, attempted, or I'm sorry, implemented a coup d'état and replaced Mossadegh with an American-held or an American-backed uh, leader, Mohammed Reza Pahlavi. He is a dictator, and he is pro-U.S., and this is going to lead to more and more and more anti-Western resentment within the country of Iran, and we'll talk about that when we get to 1970s. Um, over in Egypt, their uh, leader, uh, Gamal Nasser, had wanted to build a dam on the um, uh, Nile River. He had asked for uh, some money um, and instead received money from the Soviet Union. The Western countries freaked out uh, and uh, basically said that he couldn't have um, any more help. NASA responded by nationalizing the Suez Canal, basically taking control of the Suez Canal away from the British and French stockholders who controlled it. Uh, the Suez crisis really comes in when Great Britain, France, and Israel leave leaving the United States out notice, coordinate an attack uh, on the uh, Egyptian people at the Su to regain the Suez Canal, uh, leaving out of Israel to the go and regain the Suez Canal. The U.S. didn't know that this was going on. Uh, the Soviet Union was freaking out, uh, demanding an end to this invasion, or else they would have sent Soviet troops in. Eisenhower admonishing his allies for not including him in this uh, idea, though, however, to some degree backed them when he issued his Eisenhower Doctrine in 1957. Uh, and it's similar to what we've seen before. The United States will send money, it will send troops to support any Middle Eastern country who is threatened by communism. So, once again, this is containment, but the Eisenhower Doctrine is specifically focusing on uh, the Middle East, okay? So whereas the Truman Doctrine focused on Greece and Turkey, the Eisenhower Doctrine is focusing on the Middle East. Uh, and this Eisenhower Doctrine really was put to a test uh, in 1958 in Lebanon when the United States backed the anti-communist uh, leaders to keep communism from going into Lebanon. Uh, here you see the Egyptian President Kamal Nasser who nationalized the Suez Canal. So other areas to focus on when it comes to uh, the Cold War. Part of the Cold War is also known as the space race. Who can develop the best technology and beat the other side out? Remember, this is a very us versus them uh, mentality. And part of the space race is not just let's go into space and have scientific research, but let's use that research and use that technology to fight the other side. In 1957, the Soviet Union developed ICBM capability. These are intercontinental ballistic missiles that have the capability of traveling thousands of miles with a nuclear warhead attached to the top. Uh, the United States freaks out. I add into that the Soviet Union also launched the first satellite using the same technology known as Sputnik 1. What are they looking at? What can they see? The United States instantly starts stepping up its technology game. We have to beat the communists. This is a space race. And so what this means is reinforcing education in the United States, focusing on math and science. Uh, spending billions of dollars to build up our NASA program, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, uh, for missile development. Um, and by 1959, the United States had also achieved ICBM uh, status. But at this point, Dwight D. Eisenhower, who is about to uh, uh, leave office, well, as he's leaving office, begins focusing on the combination of defense, private corporations, and political interests. He refers to this as the military-industrial complex. And he warns the American people to beware of this because this is going to be a shaky um, uh, relationship. Here is Sputnik 1. So, in 1958, um, a ceasefire was called together for nuclear testing. Uh, but the Cold War tensions continue on. So, uh, the leaders, the United States and the Soviet Union, Khrushchev and uh, Eisenhower, met in Paris to have a peace summit. The problem is that right in the middle of this peace summit, um, 
the uh, one of the American spy planes, a U-2 spy plane, was shot down over the Soviet Union with pilot Francis Gary Powers being uh, captured by the Soviet Union. Um, Khrushchev uh, freaked out about this and walked out of the summit, of this arms race summit, uh, making Eisenhower kind of look like a fool. Francis Gary Powers was actually tried for espionage within the Soviet Union uh, and was released after 17 months. The United States and the Soviet Union made a little bit of a trade, but this the U-2 debacle really hurt America's image as a peace agree or a peacemaker because here we were secretly spying on the Soviet Union. Of course, they were doing the same to us, though. Here you see the trial of Francis Gary Powers in the Soviet Union. Now, our desire to contain communism also spread to Latin America as well. Um, for years and years and years, remember, we have been known as the bad neighbors down in Latin and South America. Also add to that the fact that the United States has pretty much been dominating relations with Cuba since the Spanish-American War. Um, we have heavy bus business interests there as well. So in 1959, an anti-American communist uh, dictator comes to power through a coup d'etat. Fidel Castro overthrew the American-backed uh, Batista in 1959. He wins the hearts of many of the Cubans by redistributing land, taking it away from the wealthy, and giving it to the peop those uh, in poverty. Those that, who had lived uh, at the top end of Cuban uh, society uh, tro ex exiled themselves from Cuba, escaped, many of them coming to the United States because they were not facing a very good system under a Fidel Castro-dominated government in uh, Cuba. In 1960, uh, Eisenhower has held office two times. He can no longer run anymore because the 22nd Amendment has been ratified, limiting our terms for president to two. Uh, and so the grand old party, or the Republican Party, the GOP, nominated Richard Nixon. Remember, he had been Eisenhower's VP for the past eight years. The Democrats nominated um, John F. Kennedy from Massachusetts. He will be the first Catholic president um, at this time. John Kennedy, he comes from a wealthy, prominent family. He is young. He is charismatic. He is good looking. He has a very attractive wife. Um, he looks very good to the American people. Uh, add to that in September of 1960, in the first ever televised debate, John Kennedy, who had hired an, uh, a TV producer, he wore the right clothes, he wore makeup that would be, uh, that make him look good on television. Contrast that to Nixon. Nixon had been very sick prior to this debate. He wore no makeup. He looked sweaty. He looked uncomfortable. And so when people watched the televised debate on TV, they said that Kennedy had won, quote unquote, the debate. But people listening to it on the radio heard how uh, much more experienced Nixon was compared to Kennedy. And they said that Nixon had won. But what is changing here is image becomes more important than what you are saying. Uh, and the TV is really playing more and more of a prominent role. In fact, uh, many people would argue that image has replaced the printed word for the natural language of politics. And so in probably one of the closest ever elections of, all, of our history, uh, Eisenhower squeaked by with a victory. But the popular margin... Uh, uh, the popular vote margin was only about 118,000 votes out of a total of 68 million votes cast. Many people argue that his appearance on that first televised debate maybe gave him enough of a push to push him over Nixon in this election. Here you see Nixon, or I'm sorry, here you see JFK and his wife. Once again, him giving a speech in 1960. And the uh, front page of the New York Times when he is elected the electoral map for 1960 as well. So last but not least, let's talk about the end of the 1950s from a societal level. Um, we've already talked about some of the focus on um, conformity, that there is a real push in the 1950s to conform, to live in the right kind of house, to have the right kind of family, to appear like everything is uh, great. Um, this is going to create some controversy in society. 
also adding to this controversy is the changing nature of our society. We are moving away from an industrial society and blue-collar workers. In fact, 1954 is considered the high watermark of unions, uh, more towards a white-collar society or a post-industrial society. That's in part uh, aided by that GI Bill, sending men to college to give them better opportunities for jobs. But Back to this idea of conformity. For many women, you know, you have this idea of leave your job that you'd had during World War II. Go home and be Susie Homemaker. Um, this cult of domesticity is really returning. But at the same time, America really truly needs women to work. Uh, there are tons and tons of pink collar jobs available. Pink collar jobs are traditionally, traditionally women's jobs. Think of a secretary as the perfect example. This really creates a psychological strain on women. What am I supposed to be? We saw the same thing during the Industrial Revolution with women going to work in the textile industry. Should I be a working person or should I stay at home? So in 1960, probably one of the most famous books for the feminist movement came out, written by Betty Friedan, The Feminine Mystique. Uh, it challenged this image of women as just a homemaker. You know, here is a woman in this story that cooks and cleans and uh, plays with her children and does everything, and she wonders, is this all that I have? This book is oftentimes uh, thought to be the jumpstart of the feminist movement that we're going to see moving into the 60s and the 70s. Other challenges to uh, society, The Lonely Crowd, uh, published in the 1950s, really challenges this conformity that was going on in the 1950s. Um, also, The Man in the Gray Flannel Suit, this was a novel written in 1955, showing the, uh, the dissatisfa dissatisfaction that men had with the society. That here is a man, he lives in the perfect suburban house, he has the perfect American family, he goes to work, and every day he wears the same gray flannel suit. And he also wonders, is this all I have? So it is challenging this conformity of the 1950s. Um, part of this uh, conformity or this commercialization had already started to affect the media, but it is breaking out in little bits here and there, challenging that conformity. For example, singers like uh, Elvis Presley really bring rock and roll music to the forefront. Here is a white person singing traditionally black R&B music and bluegrass music, uh, adding in some sexuality into it. This makes it more uh, popular because it becomes more wide, wide, uh, mainstream, because white society can listen to this type of music. Society is starting to change into the 1960s. Another uh, image of the changing nature of society is Marilyn Monroe. She gives this new idea of what is defined as sex in our society. Here is a woman. She is curvaceous. She is commercialized by Playboy. Uh, and she is considered the perfect women, woman. But it is going against that traditional American society in the 1950s, that leave-it-to-beaver America of the 1950s. And that is it for Chapter 37.